Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me now? Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Good evening, and um, it is my great pleasure and honor to host, at least virtually, on MSU Facebook, Paul Gravett, our dear colleague, a uh, great comic scholar, curator, researcher, editor, blogger, and it is really our uh, it's really a fantastic opportunity that he will share with us his knowledge on comics and exhibiting comics and comics in art history, basically, and position of the comics in art history and in museums and galleries. And the lecture will take place in the context of the uh, final week of the exhibition to be continued arts and visual uh, comics and visual culture in Croatia. So since we don't, since Paul has a lot of things to talk about and we don't have so much time. Uh, I will just save time for his lecture and maybe for some discussion uh, later. So the lecture will start right now and after an hour we'll have some time for discussion and, uh, and we invite everybody to write their questions and comments via Facebook. So Paul, thank you very much and yes, I will please. Okay. Hello, thank you very much, Lesna. Very nice to be invited and nice to see you again. Unfortunately, not seeing you in person in Zagreb as I was hoping to be, but uh, I'm determined to come there uh, at some stage in the near future. Um, and yeah, fantastic this, this times with the last few days, you finish on Sunday of your major exhibition of uh, Croatian comics, which I'm really thrilled that you've put together. Um, and I've seen some fantastic photographs of it. It's a really a landmark exhibition. Uh, congratulations on doing this. Now I'm going to do some screen sharing, I think, is that right? So I'm going to share my screen. There we go. And we're going to get to um, make sure that my PowerPoint is open. Just a minute. There we go. And we share. Great. There we are. Uh, hopefully you can all see that okay and um, welcome. Yeah, this is of course is a fantastic image by the way um, by Will Eisner um, who has a Will Eisner week. Uh, I think it's just about completing uh, right now in, in early March to coincide with his um, his date of birth but actually really it, there's, it's, an, it's an Eisner year every year. I mean Eisner's had an enormous impact of course on comics and this image was the cover of graphic storytelling and I just think it's a lovely one to open the talk with, a talk, talk, as I say, the art of comics from cave walls to museum walls because I mean, the image itself is beautiful. I mean we know that cave painters didn't actually use individual panels but we do know well enough I think that a lot of what they painted was meant to be narrated, was certainly meant to be understood as um, representing the world, representing perhaps also stories of hunts or whatever else, uh, or imaginary, uh, imaginary animals and creatures. Uh, so it's very much rooted, it seems to me, in where comics come from. And that's what I'm going to be going on to because, um, I think this is going to work now, is it? What do I press? Oh, it's the space bar. What do I press from my press? Um, is it arrow? Um, I'm sorry to pause there for a moment, but I've had this problem where I can't actually forward the slide in this in this mode. So um, my apologies for this. I don't quite know why that is. It was working before. No, I think we have to start again. I'm going to have to edit this. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to edit this. Uh, I'm going to stop the screen share for the moment. Uh, um, and try again. If I open this, when I take it out of the of that mode and then go into here, and share the screen, and we do this version of it. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm sorry to anyone that's watching this if uh, you had a bit of a technical glitch there. Me had the technical glitch. This is, let's, let's restart. So take two. Thank you very much, Yasna. Nice to be here. And I'm taking you on a talk here about the art of comics from cave walls to museum walls. So that's spanning potentially centuries in a very short space of time. But I'm hoping to here to be able to cover some issues and ideas around where comics have come from and where they're going, especially now in the 
world of fine art, in the world of museums and galleries. And just to show you a connection with um, artwork on cave walls, the image there previously by Will Eisner, um, this shows you an extraordinary artist that uh, I got to meet during some times in Brazil uh, called Tito Narua, Tito on the street, who actually does full street art comics on walls. And there is some discussion in art circles that perhaps if anything has brought back rock painting or painting at least onto concrete, it is street art. And this is the scale that he works at. You can see him just very small bottom there. He works on an absolutely gigantic scale. And even more brilliantly, these are, not only are these comics, of course, individually, but in fact, he's also made comics that are panel by panel in different locations around the city of Rio de Janeiro. And here, for example, when the Olympics were held in Rio a few years ago, a whole side of the building was turned into a a comic strip, and that's rock art on a truly <laughs> a tremendous scale. Now, um, I'm talking to you uh, at the time of the exhibition to be continued um, about Croatian comics um, at the um, Contemporary Art Museum in Zagreb, currently coming to a close on the 14th of March before it uh, continues a tour. And um, my good friend Zika Tamburic has sent me some very interesting background, as did uh, Jasna, about what's special and what happened about comics in, in, this, in reaching their uh, um, recognition, their, their acceptance, and certainly leading to the current show in Zagreb that I've just mentioned. And this is a, um, a two very interesting publications from the 70s. Uh, on the left, there's a special issue of Cultura, which ran several very academic and interesting cutting edge articles um, about comics, note the year 1975. We're going to find as I go through this talk that a lot of things emerged through the 60s into the 70s. It really was that era that changed a lot of comics around the world. And it was particularly influenced by French bon dessinée, uh, as, as we'll come to see, the French comics movement that really pushed adult comics even beyond what the American underground had pioneered. And on the right here is the magazine Pegasus. Uh, from 74, uh, again focusing on comics and visual media, and as Zika uh, explained to me here, both of these magazines had a quite a big impact um, in the whole region and were seen really as signposts of change and um, also as, as, a, as where comics could go in, in, in Yugoslavia and specifically here in Croatia. Now in terms of Croatian comics, when I came to put together the 1001 comics you must read before you die, which of course was an insane project um, because there are many more than a thousand and one. Um, but when we came to do this, I had a whole team, including my friend Ziga Tamburic, um, putting together what we thought was the most as, most as possible, the most international survey. So it wasn't just gonna be focused on English language or American or European. It would actually try and include work that perhaps wasn't even available yet in English. Um, and amongst those, we were able to include uh, Andrea Maurovic's Old Tomcat from 1937. The great thing I should point out, by the way, is that, that as well as the article by Zika on the left, there's also this full page. And because it's illustrated, this entry has appeared in every edition, because 1001 Comics gets translated into French, German, Spanish, Italian, I think other languages. It's been appearing, in other words, it's been now in discussion and be noted in many languages because of this book. Now, any creation of a canon, who gets into it, who doesn't, is hugely controversial. But I, with this book, I wanted to absolutely make as big and wide open and forward-looking a canon as we could with a team of around 60 experts um, helping me out to make a really important and hopefully useful book for the future. And Marovic, Marovic's work, uh, his original artwork from comics, but also from his, his, his oil paintings and other work is really important to the region and to Croatian um, culture. And I'm very pleased to see that, uh, as, my, as Jasna kindly told me, there was a major exhibition only a few years ago at the MSU Zagreb of his artwork, which is both um, often very political, included political cartoon material, included also oil paintings, but also included um, quite explicit and um, beautifully produced pornography. And in fact, prior to that, the MSU uh, in Zagreb had posted its first 
solo show of comic artists in 1979. Here you can see the studio za Novi Strip, new comic studio, a duo from Serbia were given their own um, major show in the Contemporary Art Museum in 79, undoubtedly linked in to that whole wave of the 70s that, issued, that ushered in the changing attitudes towards comics in, uh, in cultural establishments worldwide, pretty much. And here, just as a glimpse, um, of some shots from the current exhibition, uh, which I wish I could see. I love the top left image, which has got a big list of lots of the artists featured. It includes names that are familiar outside Croatia, not least uh, Mirko Ilic, whose work used to appear in Epic magazine from, uh, from Marvel Comics, from Epic Comics, and also Igor Corde, for example, who has of course has worked for the French and American market and is you know, absolutely brilliant artist too. So I thought I'm going to look at lots of stuff here and bring up lots of ideas and I'm also hoping we can discuss some of them. But um, what defines comics is, is one of the um, continual riddles, <laughs> which um, I rather like rather like the fact that it hasn't been solved. I think definitions often confine as well as define. But this particular um, uh, discussion of the, the question of defining comics by Aaron Miskin throws up an interesting question. Should we even be looking to, to what comics or comics-like precursors, prehistory were like, such as cave paintings, for example, um, from before the times of, of of the basically print mass production explosion um, of, uh, of the medium in a printed form. Is that even relevant? Now, um, Aaron Miskin feels basically the comics, as he says here, have earned the right to be considered art on their own merits, and they don't have to be um, sort of shoehorned or connected up to uh, what came before the more, perhaps more um, accepted, culturally accepted, um, uh, art and literary history, which we can relate comics to. We doesn't necessarily need those things. Um, but I would argue perhaps that we still ought to make an effort to understand these broader sweeps because um, there's more going on here than just justifying comics. It seems to me that we don't need to do that, but it doesn't mean we've necessarily cut off what went before. But there's no doubt that when we come to some of the early attempts to relate um, commercial, industrial, mass-produced comics to some kind of um, artistic uh, heritage uh, that, that there was initially definitely an effort to to elevate them to make them to take them more seriously and to also probably also quite honestly to counter even from their very earliest days um, this is in America of course but in many places quite negative views about comics um, the cultural arbiters um, of taste, uh, and certainly you know, families, parents, teachers will find this through most of the 20th century, have certainly up until at least the 50s and 60s, were generally opposed to comics, saw them as a bad thing. And MC Gaines, Max Gaines, who established educational comics um, in the 1940s, he, by the very name, wanted to use comics as an educational platform and was convinced that they could be a learning tool, as we know they certainly are, and as a part of a strategy to combat criticism and promote, frankly, to also advertise his line of comics, he produced an exhibition that toured around America in 1942. This is very early for comics to be exhibited in gallery spaces, maybe not quite museum spaces, but it was organized um, professionally. Um, and you can see some of the comments just there. He was definitely wanted to equate them to um, forebears like Egyptian hieroglyphics, et cetera, et cetera. But showing that narrative art, this broad term of narrative art, um, essentially goes back to the first recorded picture story to the modern day, to the present day. Um, and that argument, that, that debate continued interestingly around this time, still uh, before and after the Second World War in the work, for example, of uh, Lancelot Hogben here on the right with this book from cave painting to comic strip um, and this is interesting not only because he's been trying to make connections to, about narrative art and caricature which of course is a huge influence cartooning uh, the grotesque many elements that feed into uh, the modern comics but also it, it linked into a, a development in the 1940s of isotypes which as you can see from the cover of this book on the left relate in many ways to the diagrammatic appearance of hieroglyphs, but also to infographics, the 
style of information presentation that we're completely used to today um, and which is also undoubtedly related to comics so here for example is an example um, um, for example an example page of two vertical strips in this isometric format um, which as you can just about make out here are very much like some of the modern comics we have today which are using a very simplified reduced style of drawing so you can read the text if you want to pause the image you can have a go at reading the text i quoted here but this is interesting that um that that analogy was continued of course by eisner particularly when he came to doing his graphic storytelling book but in in the, even in the, the previous book sequential art as he tried to explain what made comics special what made them a distinct art form neither art nor literature but some unique fusion uh, some hybrid version of them both and this is where of course comics are often very difficult to pin down and difficult to lodge into the accepted cultural realms um, here's for example the definition that Scott McLeod came up with um, which is deliberately quite broad and in fact ends up encompassing a lot of the prehistory of comics um, and another one that's not so different in fact in some ways still using juxtaposed images but still trying to refine it to avoid too many elements being introduced any definition can sometimes be either too narrow or too broad but essentially the definitions of comics um, raise all sorts of questions as to what's included even amongst things that we might perfectly accept are comics i'm asking here for example that one definition certainly that it doesn't apply is that they need to inc include any speech balloons which are thought to be a, an iconic element of all comics but certainly not as we well know but not everybody does that comics can work perfectly well without any text and certainly without any balloons and that wordless silent comics are an enormously rich field uh, that goes back uh, at least to um, Franz Masseril for example uh, also the very fact that we think of comics having to have borders I mean these images of balloons and borders used as you'll have noticed perhaps in many comic exhibitions including the current one in Zagreb to kind of denote uh, we see a, a balloon we see a, a panel border we know that means it's a comic exhibition it's comics well no a lot of them a lot of comics simply don't conform to that and haven't done for a long time as you can see on the left going back to Steinlin in the 19th century it's a very very it's a form that def continually defies being defined much like the graphic novel as well which is one of the wonderful things about it because I don't particularly want the form to get too defined I'd much prefer if it continually confounds definition by stretching what we can do with this with words and pictures or just maybe with pictures on their own similarly also we have the question of narrative even this gets questioned when we have fabulously strange abstract comics um, the one on the right for example there is by sampler man um, whose work is just basically like being on drugs but on paper I suppose <laughs> but tremendously inventive and you even even when you can't make sense something in your brain still sort of tries to make a weird logical narrative out of the most nonsensical similarly questions of what about work did it have to be published has it got to be in printed form what about a comic that a page of a comic that's not appeared in print um even not even perhaps even finished in this case on the right still in its pencil form if that's obviously still a comic so not that not even not only printing but even publishing is not a definition and in terms of them the use of different media the different artistic approaches that is this is completely wide open um i think it should be more open i'm always uh, for example I, on the left here i'm i saw an exhibition of uh, the <clears throat> polish no czech Czech artist Frantisek Scala when I was in Prague uh, a couple of years ago and his work is definitely not just comics it includes many other practices within his 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 work um, but the world of photographic comics is to me still hugely underexplored and underdeveloped um, and certainly within the world of photography which as we know is very much in the museum um realm there are museums there are photography museums there are major institutions that have embraced photography full on almost from the word go and haven't waited so long as they have with comics to take them on board into their collections comics as as uh, sorry photography as comics is still not really fully accepted and fully developed in my opinion and there's a future there on the right um we have the use of of craft of craft 
um, approaches, in this case embroidery, which uh, can also really enrich the art form. As you'll see here, for example, in the, an, a forthcoming book, literally out in, uh, out, uh, where are we, next month, in fact, here in the UK by the excellent Gareth Brooks, who is, has done embroidered comics before, but here is combining that with pyrography, which as far as I know, is may never have been used before in comics. This is literally drawing with fire, uh, work getting burnt or singed to create outlines or to create uh, uh, soft textures and tones. Um, and it's a beautiful use of these two techniques to go with the story of, um, the, of, a, of a medieval play, the dancing plague, St. Vitus's dance, essentially. Um, similarly, an artist, as we know, many artists in the fine art field or who've been accepted into the fine art field here, Faith Ringgold, who makes these beautiful quilted tableaus, which are undoubtedly narrative, they incorporate text, they incorporate sequence, but are they comics? Well, they are, her story quilts, I think, come very close to that. Um, similarly, I love the fact that <laughs> we don't need to have drawings in comics, even the fact that uh, images seem to be, should be there. Well, this is a brilliant um, parody, of course, of that idea, a Gary Larson far side, where <clears throat> the entire newspaper for ghosts is full of ghostly comics. The far side, for example, becomes the other side. Um, Blondie and Dagwood becomes Blondie and Deadwood. Um, and of course, there are no drawings because there's no characters to be seen. They're all ghosts in the comics. <clears throat> but why not? We know there are uh, comics that are made without drawings, that are purely text-based comics. And when, <clears throat> when we start to look around um, at our environment, <clears throat> here, for example, <clears throat> a statue at King's Hall Station in London, which greets you when you get off the Eurostar, uh, this around the base has essentially a carved narrative. And this clearly also <clears throat> is a form of modern comic. <clears throat> right. As for their invention, <laughs> I love this panel. Um, this is uh, this is a uh, scene by the um, French artist Fumour uh, showing Galileo inventing comics, and this, of course, is also done too as a dig, um, um, a kind of a slight kind of jibe at people that celebrate cinema as being the great invention and how cinema and how also more accurately so much of comics obviously is um, relies on cinematic techniques. Um, a, a comment that is still used quite a lot, frankly, and still believed it's patently not possible because comics are already inventing many techniques, uh, close ups and zooms and cuts that exist pre com pre cinema in comics. So comics didn't have to learn those, though they obviously have learned from each other. But I love that the quote here just says, uh, Galileo is saying, I just, I cut out the, vi the, the vital images, the comprehension from this film, this film strip, stick them onto a sheet of white paper chronologically and add speech written into balloons judiciously placed in each vignette, and it works. So you'll please know that Galileo was able to invent comics using strips of film um, in some distant time or undefined time in the past. It's a, a bit of nonsense, but also a very clever critique of the fact that comics are not film and comics predate and anticipate film. Uh, and if we really look back, and I'm going to look back at quite a few um, early things now, um, we have to be very careful here about what we say that must be a comic or that is like a comic. It has so many elements or what look like elements in terms of panels, sequence, balloons or balloon-like um, scrolls or bonderols or elements that you think that must be a comic, but they're not very often not working in the way that a comic does. They're not necessarily, even the text itself isn't uh, uh, descriptive. It might be emblematic. It might not be anything like the sequential art that we presume it is, but something in it continually draws many of us back to look at it and go, this was something we were doing centuries ago. And th some of the thinking, some of the use of images and sequence of repeated characters of wanting to convey things this way is deep seated and continues and connects, it seems to me, to people working today, making and reading comics. And that kind of tradition, the way traditions continue, um, is that good here, for example, this is just off, going off to Indian now, just briefly. This is an old art. It goes back 500 years, but this is an art that's still around in modern day uh, Rajasthan. It's a performance based um, wooden folded 
um, portable shrine, which is purely visual and only works really when you have a, a narrator, a performer telling you the story, the narrator will touch an individual image and that image will re be relevant to what he or she is saying. But this art form is not dead. It's still very much alive. It's even being used now for educational narratives. Um, and the art form is still, they're, they're still making these things and they're still using them. They're still touring from household to household. Um, that's 500 years old, as is this. This obviously is definitely 500 years old, um, but it's got elements, undoubtedly elements of comics because it is narrative, because it's, um, it's using text captions, if you like. Um, this is uh, one of them. In fact, the central one is based on a lost painting by Raphael. And one could imagine even a contemporary artist reworking this beautiful format, just the very composition of, the, of this, of this narrative, these scenes, in fact, from Ovid uh, into a modern you know, reworking, re definitely using the structure. But when we do come to print, uh, the all important element that, um, uh, and print certainly on, on a mass scale, not the, a more kind of very limited scale and a very expensive scale, like some of those pre previous things I showed you, um, when we get to the, the mass produced production, um, clearly something is, that does change. It becomes affordable. It ties into mass literacy, it ties into leisure time, it ties into people of all classes actually being able to own images and words uh, in printed form. This is a particularly fascinating image here because it's from William Hogarth's um, uh, Harlot's Progress uh, from 1732. But as you may know, these were originally issued by Hogarth himself uh, as individual prints, um, six in all. But here, the first three of them have been put together onto one sheet. It's almost certainly pirated, unofficial. <laughs> um, uh, but somebody thought, well, why not put them together? Um, and indeed, why not? Because uh, this, it's actually almost making uh, a, a more multi-panel page than, than a usual uh, Hogarth progress would be. But that's fascinating to see. And if we just whiz through a little bit of this early history, Hogarth um, really was one of the early theoreticians I know he was British, and that might sound like I'm being a bit jingoistic here, but you know, he was pretty influential, and he did have not only um, practice, but theory behind what he was doing with his work, with the distinct, distinct, distinct between character, character and caricature, his, uh, and his, also his understanding of, uh, of the, the way lines can captivate us, um, and as you say, lead the eye on a wanton kind of chase. That is certainly one of our one of the appeals of comics still is our exploring of line on paper and the progress many other artists followed in Hog and Hogarth's uh, steps um, the term progress is one of those other early alternative words for a comic a progress often um, not necessarily progress towards something better often it can be <laughs> decline um, but it can, and it's definitely much for laughs very often it's satirical uh, and they may be separate scenes, so it's not necessarily very much moment to moment action, but it does build up, of course, into a narrative. Um, but there are also examples such as this one, for example, again, uh, which shows you definitely, a, one presumes a moment to moment, or certainly a repeated moment um, of growing intimacy between these two lovebirds, which is a charming early, early kind of comic. So we touched now uh, on the name, comics, uh, it's a name which we, in many, it, it obviously is used in other languages, used strip. There are many other words for it around the world. Um, but the word um, comics uh, or bande dessinée uh, didn't actually get established very early on by Töpfer, Rudolf Töpfer, the Swiss teacher and inventor uh, of many of the, the groundwork of comics. And again, another artist and theor theoretician, theorist about the, the form. But uh, he could have chosen manga, by the way. Manga, this is a, a, a cartoon imagining him trying to come up with the name. It's a cartoon by uh, Francois Erol. And manga, of course, was a term, by the way, that, at least in Japan, though not for modern comics, but for certainly for images and somewhat cartoonish sketched images, um, which was popularized, not invented, but popularized by Hokusai around the 18, 1814. So around this time, it's just possible, but of course, Aaron is making a joke here as well. I'm going to whiz through this a little bit because Tupper is, um, is, in, is an important figure, but I've got probably too many images to go into it, but it's important because, as I said, he did theorize. He did theorize about what comics could be 
And while some of his theories were rooted in science of the time that thought about the way you drew a face, the physiognomy would immediately indicate um, the kind of character a person was, which is somewhat retrograde thinking, perhaps. There's no doubt, of course, the comics and caricature use that and probably still use that, frankly. We still have those cliches inbuilt into the system. Um, but what's interesting to show you is that Töpfer also was very influenced by what went before, which is why all the stuff I showed you earlier, and this is an, an interesting history from 1813 that possibly Töpfer would have seen, I don't know, but certainly um, there was enough, and even at this stage, looking back to the origins of early caricature going way back to medieval times. And this quote here from Töpfer, which you can partly see, is just saying that he did acknowledge the um, influence, even if it was drawn by some, as he says, um, some unskilled monk. He would look at, um, uh, he would look at those um, images, uh, as he says here, for long hours in public libraries, looking at 15th century books to study art in its infancy, the merits of which are erased and utterly lost in sophisticated art. And you might say perhaps he was slightly excusing the fact that his own drawing, this is actually not the finished one, it's a draft, um, but his drawing you know, wasn't exactly super finished and fabulous, it certainly wasn't on the level of a Hogarth necessarily. Um, and he did send this draft um, uh, to Hogarth. Uh, he sent drafts of the project he was about to try and do, and um, to, to, sorry, to, not to Hogarth, forgive me, but to Goethe, to uh, Wolfgang, to, to the famous German poet, philosopher, one of the greatest minds of German, of, of, of the period, who, though near the end of his life, in fact, he died the following year, at Christmas in 1831, he loved what Töpfer had sent him, this adventure of Dr. Festus. Um, and the draft, or the, 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 the version, I think probably was a more finished version by that point, but I think this encouraged um, Töpfer enough to go on to produce this and other albums in this format, this landscape format, not using blooms very much, but using still a lot of sequential techniques a lot of panel progressions, a lot of um, cartooning techniques and shorthands that we now completely adopt into comics. Um, and their impact was remarkable. This is, by the way, this is an advert on the back of his essay advertising his other work. So he was a marketeer as well, promoting what he was doing. And in the essay, he incorporated not only his handwritten text, but also drawings and examples of his techniques of what he was what he was proposing. So Töpfer in all was tremendously um, innovative and did see that comics, the dual advantage of greater conciseness and more relative clarity, the picture story of all things being equal should squeeze out the other because it would address itself with greater liveliness to a greater number of minds. Now that doesn't, if that doesn't panic a lot of people in the rarefied world of art and literature, I don't know what would. That was you know, warning you that this stuff's potent. And of course, both Goethe and Töpfer were right. They could see where comics could become extraordinarily powerful and popular. So this is another beginning, if you like. And I've got a lot more to show you, so I'm gonna to have to speed up a little bit. But this is another Eisner image, but showing comics in the museum, on the museum world, a nice double take here of, of Eisner's spirit looking at a drawing of himself and being recognized amongst the public by a little boy next to him. It's the cover, by the way, of this really important book, um, which came out only last year, a tremendous collection of essays edited by Kim A. Munson. I happen to have one in it, but it's, the fact is the other essays are way better and cover a lot of fascinating background, which I'll be tapping into a little bit here as well, of the arrival of comics in museums. Um, it raises, there are many questions about what, we put into museums from comics because the artwork for comics made for comics by great artists, great illustrators is not art made as art. It's art made for reproduction. It's art that's going to go through all kinds of processes, mechanical in the past, now of course, digital, um, but it's made to be printed in multiples. And um, did artists know that what they were making was actually could be considered artwork? Well, certainly there were enough artists early on. One of them here is George Harriman, who at least 
made the step of not only hand coloring uh, the original artwork for a Sunday page of Crazy Cat here, also beautifully designing the and coloring the mount and edging of the frame and giving it to a friend as a gift. So it's, it's signed to a gift to, to a friend. So this is somebody who obviously um, saw his work as art, at least the original art, artwork as art, at the same time as it was being mass produced without any of these beautiful subtle colors in, an, in, in Sunday newspapers across America. But you know, that's the question we have to think about. And the struggle of artists and the fact that artists so often uh, unlike Perriman, who had a, a basically a lifetime contract with the Hearst Syndicate of Newspapers, um, someone like Wallace Wood, the great Wallace Wood American artist, he had enormous lows at times and struggles, um, and even parodied um, the, the art um, aspect of his work by producing, here you can see, an honorary diploma from the Wallywood School of Comic Art, which you could uh, send away and apply uh, for, for a copy of the certificate. And he lived a tough life. I mean, this is a very stripped down, basic studio he was living in only a few years before. And sadly, he took his own life. And um, he produced work that was actually too original and too artistically rich and, and labor intensive for the mass industry of serial pulp disposable comics produced in the American market. Uh, if only he'd been around or had been able to stay around long enough for the development of the, the comic artwork that produced for graphic novels, the publishers and the, the development of the art form away from essentially assembly line and slave trade, which essentially one could argue it was. So um, yeah. And this brings up an interesting issue as to, you know, what do we show? And do we show original artwork? Well, the, this is a quote, I'm sorry, it's, it's slightly obscured here, but this is a quote um, from Brian Bolland, just recently discussing the fact there's going to be a big a deluxe edition reproducing his original artwork for Judge Dredd, same size, with all, with warts and all, basically, with all of the production stuff, all of the tape and correction and fading and whatever. And he's, he actually believes that, well, he draws these artworks for reproduction. He doesn't necessarily want all these blemishes, um, however interesting they be, may be, uh, to be reproduced. He, would, he makes, wants them to be made just as they, are, as they should be into the finished work. And he does raise issues about whether this is fetishizing, essentially, the original artwork. But the balance here, of course, is that for many people, these pages are magical because it's where the artist's pen touched the the page, the paper for the first time. They have an aura in the same way that any other artwork has, if, it, if, the, if it's an original in that sense. Um, but it's a good question. And it's undoubtedly that the reason so much original artwork now is becoming collectible is it's partly nostalgic, it's partly also because it's a one-off. And because it's, and it's, also, it's also larger, because <laughs> one of the simple definitions of art, so-called fine art, uh, is it should be big. I mean, that's basically what it should be. I mean, because comics mostly aren't big. Um, their, their artwork is often no much bigger than maybe A3 or A2 perhaps, but there's, it's not as big as most proper you know, gallery art. Um, then that's also a problem because galleries are not really made to accommodate relatively tiny bits of artwork. Um, so, um, right, let's come on to, um, where are we now? Yes, where am I? oh yes. And then just to clarify, over the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to, look at, at, I'm going to exclude a lot of elements of the museum and comics because I just felt otherwise we get, it gets too diffuse. But as I mentioned here, there are comic creators who have their own museums. This is something that's been going on for quite a long time. Um, this is the one that's dedicated to Tezuka in Japan. And there are many of them in Japan because quite a lot of the artwork that is left behind by great manga artists there doesn't have a home, and also because it, to avoid expensive inheritance taxes, and uh, they have to undervalue the artworks. So the best solution is to keep them low valued and find somewhere, maybe in the city where the, the artist lived, that will set up a local one man or one person museum. And that's why there's almost no developed market like there is, certainly in most other countries, for, for high, high priced auctions of original comic artwork from uh, in Japan. It just hasn't really developed in the same way. Okay, so we're excluding those, also excluding all 
of the fabulous museums which are out there and still coming devoted to comics. Um, there are, you know, huge ones, Angoulême, Brussels, so many. Uh, but they are, they've already, they're already they've, they've said basically, we can't get into the art world, let's make a museum of our own. I want to look at what's happened elsewhere when comics have struggled to make it into some kind of exhibition in, in public and preferably in an art gallery. So I'm going to touch here on something that I've only just <laughs> been discovering the last um, week or so in researching this. Um, what was the first international exhibition of comics? Well, we'll come up to what was certainly the first one with original artwork, but it seems possibly the first that was international, i.e. not just American, um, which is important, I think, to stress, was this one in 1950 in Milan. And it was done as part of a sort of conference, but it was an exhibition free open to the public about both children's books and comics, so it covered the two. And here's some of the people that were involved. There were Italian publishers, but also, as you can see here, um, they were, it was not featuring artwork, it was featuring uh, the printed comics themselves, but not just from Italy, but from many other places. It had a, a narration, a narrative in a kind of comics letter, you can see top left there. It went back to the um, 1900s or so, looking at American uh, newspaper strips, then the comic books, it also had Tintin, it had works from Japan, even from Russia. Uh, some were comics, some were more children's books, but it was a, a very populist exhibition, but it had another reason for existing. There was at this time in 1950, as in many post-war countries, a big debate about whether comics for children were good or bad. This was still being debated at this point, and there was a discussion, a, a sort of congress, a, a big debate any, anyway, um, around that as part of this. But, um, and there was even actually a, a paper produced about it. Notably, notably, by the way, UNESCO were involved. And there's a whole history of this to be unpicked because UNESCO as a global organization was involved with many campaigns to certainly question and actually sometimes to censor and control comics in many countries, not so well documented. But sadly, <laughs> six months later uh, in Italy, by this stage, the debate and the scaremongering and the the efforts against to control to control especially to, against comics partly fueled here by the catholic um family front uh a, a, a obviously a a, a family of values um very conformist christian organization that was alarmed at what was in comics even though these comics were actually of course often not aimed at children but aimed at adults raised produced this exhibition and raised a lot of awareness not necessarily just amongst um, adults, parents to worry them and teachers, one presumes as well, but also of course amongst children because it's on good record from a, a similar exhibition to this one organized here in the UK by the National Union of Teachers, very much like this, very didactic, very alarmist, um, that it had a very, it actually drove quite a few kids to go and find those very comics that they hadn't other, otherwise heard about before. In other words, it promoted the very comics they were trying to demonize, but it did have a big effect. And we know that the issue of censorship control on and the demonizing of comics as harmful publications is something that went across almost well, a, a huge number of countries and cultures and echoes and inhibited comics getting accepted tremendously uh, for, for many years. Um, so we come to what was the first exhibition of um, original artwork international artwork from uh, Europe, particularly also from America and from Brazil in Brazil. This was in June 51, only a few months after that previous one I showed you in Italy. Um, there, it was a remarkable thing that happened, driven by uh, a bunch of artists who were, were in touch directly with important artists in America, like Milton Kniff and uh, Will Eisner, for example, and they were able to get physical artworks sent to them, and they had an exhibition always to go here. And the, the five, the team of five, were all of them actually artists themselves. So they're going to include their work. They wanted to celebrate Brazilians' tremendous um, uh, uh, standard of comics at that time in the fifties. But as it's explained here uh, in this next image, the they offered the exhibition to the Museum of Art in Sao Paulo but they were against comics at that time. It was not obviously the right time in 51. So they put it on in, a, in this cultural center only for about a fortnight or so. It wasn't a major 
a major long-term show, but it was a landmark. And it particularly because it showed original artwork and it tried to explain some of what made comics unique, what made it a medium, what made it um, something to be taken seriously. And this exhibition has an echo. 50 years later, there was a further um, sort of retrospective, if you like, of the show in the um, in, in the, uh, the, the Museum of uh, Fine Arts in Sao Paulo, and then uh, in 2012, so 11 years after that, a further exhibition celebrated Quadrinhos 51. So it's had an echo and an impact in Brazil uh, to, to quite an important level. Um, we come to France. Um, right, well, this is a fascinating museum of comics, <laughs> which um, was attempted to be opened um, in Paris in 1966, in the basement of the, the Le Jean Renoir, there's Jean Renoir there on the left, cinema in La Pigalle in Paris. Sadly, it only opened for a few days. It was, it was a very short term thing, but the gentleman there, Claude Molitorni, with him was one of the driving forces of a movement through much of Europe, particularly in France uh, at this time, to elevate comics, to get them taken seriously. These were people often who were very driven and very fond of, driven by their nostalgia, their love, particularly of American classic newspaper strips like the work of Kniff and Hogarth and Foster and many others. Um, and uh, this is the landmark when in 67 they were able to open the doors, not of the Louvre, but of an annex of a, well, of a, a part of the Louvre, a wing of the Louvre, the Palais des Arts uh, Décoratif. Um, and there in 67, this exhibition over summer was mounted. Now, what's unusual about this one though, is it didn't feature any original artwork at all. Um, and you can see here how it was presented. These are photographs I got when I met the um, designer, Isabel Chavarro. Uh, they worked with blow-ups. This was partly, of course, to kind of, in a way, relate the images to Liechtenstein and to the blow-ups of pop art. Also to emphasize their individual panels were fabulously graphic and dynamic on, on the wall. Also, of course, for scale, to fill, that, fill the walls. Um, and also because actually in the end, the plans of Pierre Coupery, the main director of the exhibition, um, was that he wanted to eventually have, eventually have a much bigger show that would have done all of that, the first part of my lecture, would have gone back to cave paintings, would have had medieval stuff in Egyptian, lots of prehistory, wanted all of that to be brought in as well. But the museum that was not, the Palais de Arts Decoratifs was not happy about doing that, and they instead inserted a different um, second half of the show, which actually was the figuration narrative part of the exhibition, which was the label given to a group of basically cool 60s young painters making pop culture inspired paintings, some of them inspired by comics, in the kind of vogue, if you like, of pop art, but also challenging some of those things and trying to be more socially engaged with their work. But still, for comics, it was a kind of the doors open, but then the door closes, or at least half closes. Fortunately, Pierre Cupri was able to get across all of his ideas uh, with help from uh, Maurice Horn uh, and translation um, in a catalogue, which then went on to become a very important book in English and was a landmark again for understanding this wider history. Um, and from there also, the exhibition, the Paris exhibition, had an extraordinary echo uh, in Europe. It came to uh, Berlin and to London. And in 1971, I was very young, but my first experience of seeing an exhibition of comic art was the exhibition ARG at the uh, ICA in London. And that basically changed my life as many things have done, but that was one of the, the signal points of me going, I have got to understand more about comics. Seeing the originals was amazing. That's the point. By this point, these exhibitions did include original artwork, but elements of this, the original Paris show went on to travel, I believe, also to South, South America, and it, its repercussions were enormous and inspired uh, books, inspired other exhibitions along this line. It was one of the wake-up calls that led undoubtedly almost, I imagine, to those projects such as the Cultura issue in, in uh, Yugoslavia in 75. Right. Uh, and amongst the interesting exhibitions that followed on from that in the 70s, that are sometimes overlooked. Um, this is a gallery in Winnipeg, Canada, who well ahead of the time in 73, 
exhibited original artwork from Marvel. Uh, then in 78, they went ahead and did a one man show. Now, I don't know if many living comic book artists, certainly in America, anyway, that's at least then, that were given one man art gallery shows. I mean, not shows that were in a proper art gallery. Um, certainly a comic book artist like Saranko got this, this major attention. Um, but there were controversies about the first show, the structure of comics, because um, Marvel, having lent pages, then offered to sell those very pages for a thousand dollars in total to the gallery. And the gallery, I understood, understand, did buy them in good faith, but not knowing that Marvel, in fact, had no title to do this, and only shortly after would begin the rightful policy, the moral one, if not legal one, of returning the physical original artwork to their artists, which they, of course, have not done before. In fact, this is a photograph of the state of Marvel storage. Now, this, I'm not sure this, this may actually date from much earlier. It comes from the Comics Journal in 86. I imagine it is perhaps more likely in the 70s, perhaps, but um, this is where it is reproduced, but it shows not exactly uh, archival storage and conservation procedures being, uh, being used here. So um, what that demonstrates, I think, is that um, the place of where this art book goes to, the original art book for comics, who does it belong to, does it even belong on the walls of galleries, is continually being questioned. Um, and no more so perhaps than in this very somewhat really quite controversial show, which faced head on the question of how do modern art and popular culture literally cross over from that logo. And the old fashioned, perhaps slightly snobbish attitude of certain things being highbrow, elevated and snobbish. And, 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 and then of course, the lowbrow, the stuff that doesn't maybe belong in, in something like the Museum of, of Modern Art in New York. And this exhibition um, featured, um, showed the two alongside. This is perhaps the thing that was most interesting about this is that uh, um, it was able to mix the two together. Uh, in fact, it, it also triggered other exhibitions. It was part of another wave to show pop art and fine art alongside their comic sources um, so that at least some of the credit up, up to an extent could go back to the artists, for example, the artist that Lichtenstein um, repainted and completely transformed in, many, in, most, in, 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 in his own way from the, 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 the DC war and romance comic books. You can see an example of that here. But it was certainly uh, an exhibition that was very much a fine art with a kind of nod to some of the source material that could be appropriated. Certainly the source material wasn't really given the same, quite the same credibility and study and, and, and analysis. And this is what upset Art Spiegelman, the, uh, fame, the award winning author, of course, of Mouse, who produced this um, review, but really more a, a pretty outspoken critique of the attitudes of this exhibition and what, how cowardly it had been, how it hadn't taken any risks. But then, of course, this was a, a museum of modern art that wasn't necessarily ready to take the risk. Um, the fact is that many people were missing, not, 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 not least Spiegelman himself. Um, and clearly there was room for more. And in fact, this is not covered in my talk here, but it, we have seen subsequently much bigger museum exhibitions in America, for example, the Masters of Comic Book Art, Masters of Comic Art, forgive me, that was in, took two major galleries in Los Angeles to present um, a, an unfortunately entirely male panorama of, of, of major American comic strip and comic book artists in their own right as artists. That, that was a landmark that certainly in many ways this show would have sparked uh, the debate about and would have led to. But solo shows in major museums have happened uh, and had a tremendous impact. Um, and how, there's still also the question of what happens to the collections in these museums. As I've mentioned, I think at the beginning, Fortunately, the MSU in Zagreb does have comic artwork in its collection, including Morovic's uh, material, and that's held in other, other important institutions in Croatia as well. But it, having an exhibition should be more than that, in my opinion. It should also reflect a policy of opening to doing more and also to collecting, to actually including the material of comics, whether it's print or original artwork, as part of the foundational collections of these institutions. This did happen. Following the 
very important Hergé exhibition. You can see it, um, the poster there on the side. Uh, there, it, there was a, a donation. It wasn't purchased. It was a donation by Hergé's widow of this page on the left here to the, the foundations, the, the core archives of um, of the Musée, Musée National d'Art Moderne in Paris at the Centre Pompidou. And just as a wonderful note, by the way, when it was exhibited, I went to this exhibition and it was exhibited, the original was exhibited as part of another work of art called Container Zero, which was made in 88 and was designed to contain works of art. Hergé knew the artist, collected the artist's work as well, by the way, Hergé was a great collector of modern art, but it meant you couldn't see it because not only was it within this, but, but this work itself was also encased and enclosed in another um, installation, or uh, which meant that you had to spy the original artwork at a distance. So it was a very peculiar, you couldn't actually see what had been given properly without maybe a, a telescope, I suppose. And this was a very strange attitude, but there was an opening, but a late opening, as you can see, 2007, terribly late for these institutions to start um, exhibiting, but also more importantly, to start it, it collecting. And this is really where the, where the issue uh, comes up. The Pompidou Centre has done, as you can see here, has done several more exhibitions directed to comic artists, usually in their, um, the Bibliothèque um, uh, Publique d'Information, which is not necessarily in their prestige galleries, but still it's done substantially. And similarly, also the Palais de Tokyo of Modern, Modern Art Museum in Paris, they put on a major exhibition of Crumb's work. Uh, here, for example, um, you can see, this time, there we are, we can see um, a combination of works on paper, of course, but also three-dimensional works. And that included a, an astonishing uh, last gallery, which I saw, where every page of Crumb's um, remarkable adaptation of the Book of Genesis was exhibited on the wall, double or treble hung, as you can see here, um, a real feeling of you could see the complete work, which raises a whole other interesting question. When you're exhibiting work from comics, do you show, do you exhibit complete stories? Do you exhibit, even exhibit, in this case, a complete massive graphic novel? And is that not really, in fact, the work, not maybe an isolated page here or there? It's one of the issues I'm sure that cura the curators have had to deal with in this current show in, in MSU Zagreb. But this has not stopped um, the fact that we are seeing more and more of this happening. It's a very encouraging, exciting time, and it raises all sorts of questions still, uh, whether the comics are basically here as a kind of um, guaranteed um, blockbuster. You'll get lots of people in if you put comics on, you'll get a big audience, which they usually do, but then is there any, is there any follow through? Is there any change of policy? Will they ever consider showing, for example, some comics art book alongside other artists in a mixed show? Or are they always going to have to be a genius like Hergé or a one-off huge survey, which then puts the genie back into the bottle? Um, in my opinion, it should be, comics have got to be something where they eventually just are part of the, the dialogue of comics, the dialogue of art, in fact, uh, in all museums, if, if at all possible. Um, I love this exhibition. I couldn't find very many images of it, forgive me, but it's the artist is uh, shown here is Emma Talbot. She's British. She does very large, exquisite work. Um, and it was featured in a, in a uh, contemporary art museum in Perth, Western Australia. It was called Comics Tragics. And it was one of the most uh, impressively mounted exhibitions with a very small number of works and artists, but just done with such care and knowing that these works really would speak to a public because they were often, of course, not just autobiographical generally, but also really quite intense and heartfelt and even heartbreaking. Um, and that is clearly something that comics can do, certainly in the uh, more and more as we see in autobiography. Um, other institutions, for example, this one is the Musée Thomas Henry in Cherbourg, they've been running a biennale of comics. This is an interesting policy for a museum to take institutionally to say, we're gonna do a comics exhibition every two years. And they devote it to different artists. The last two have been to um, Winsor McKay and Jack Kirby, and this year it will be to Will Eisner. Um, but they've also done, of course, French artists as well. But that's a very nice policy that they are just saying, yes, we, this is part of our programming. We won't just do this um, erratically or once every decade. Um, there was, of course, also <clears throat> this last year, 
there was, and I'm sorry, I haven't got the poster, but there was a fantastic exhibition at the Musée Picasso in Paris of Picasso and comics, which was a lovely um, crossover because Picasso loved comics, read them and made some works that were certainly comics or close to comics. At the same time, of course, Picasso has inspired comic artists and been the subject or his works have been thematically quoted in comics. And um, so it was a lovely two-way dialogue um, uh, and very appropriate in, uh, in the, the Musée Picasso, who also very importantly commissioned, this to me is also something really important, the gallery specific commissioned work, the fact that an artist can make work, work on a scale, as you can see, this is very, very big frieze by Sergio Garcia. Here's just a detail from it, inspired, but also completely original, inspired by Guernica, um, really lifts what comics <clears throat> can do in the gallery space. <clears throat> so we're almost finishing now, don't worry, not much more. <laughs> um, so uh, that I think raises, again, other issues, perhaps in the future, we will see comic artists able to originate <clears throat> new projects directly for gallery spaces. And this, I think, is at least part of <clears throat> Dan Liddell's program for this very important show that's coming up. We hope, um, maybe it'll be just mostly online. It all depends, of course, on all the, the COVID restrictions, but coming up at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, who've done things before with comics, but this is big and also in incredibly important because it's bringing in finally a lot of overlooked artists, many of them uh, artists of colour who have not been included in this story. And of course, Chicago is a rich place for comics, not just now, but historically, but it's, they've de deliberately decided we're not going to go back to Dick Tracy, Little Off and Annie, all those early comics. We're going to start from the 60s, we can include the Harry Who, the, um, the art movement from the 60s in Chicago, we can have these crossovers, artists in both the art world and, and in the comics world together, and there will be new commissions. So I think this will be an, a really landmark show. And what one has to hope, of course, is that all these shows, the Zagreb show to be continued, this one, other ones going on at the moment, all have that knock-on effect of waking up other institutions who shall remain nameless, but to, to also consider that they should include comics. They've got to eventually somehow deal with this art form and get over their hang-ups and their difficulties of trying to appreciate what makes these extraordinary things art. They, they so obviously are. I'm going to close with um, perhaps, I mean, maybe these are op utopian visions. We hope these things come to be built. They also look to me somewhat over dazzling and over corporate, but ideally somewhere in all this razzle dazzle, there will be the works, there will be the printed comics, the artwork of comics, comics themselves, not their many media derivatives, whether it's animation or movies or whatever else, they will still be there. This is the forthcoming Comic-Con Museum related of course to Comic-Con San Diego. Um, very impressive imaginings of what hopefully will come and is already underway. Uh, being uh, being built, and also of course this other new museum which has already broken soil and is George Lucas's based on George Lucas's massive collection. It's one of there are other there are other museums still to come, devoted as this one is, and probably also up to a sense up to a sense the, the San Diego one too to comics, but also in a much broader category, um, calling in this case the Museum of Narrative Art visual storytelling, all those kinds of themes, which then of course embrace uh, modern developments of um, gaming and video and storyboarding for movies. In other words, all the other related arts to comics. There is a risk here though of diluting and maybe as big a risk of going back to paint painters going forward to all these new forms, which are like comics, but then of course they're not comics. But the dialogue and um, between all of these forms is rich and certainly deserves uh, spaces and with Lucas and his collection and, and millions behind it, billions behind it, it's, it's going to be an extraordinary thing to eventually hopefully get to visit. Um, and on that final thing to mention also of course that in these times, luckily thanks to Zoom, we can have these virtual presentations and similarly also thanks to all kinds of virtual reality um, uh, formats of 
exhibitions, there are many people making virtual forms of their exhibitions available and of course staying available online after the physical shows are closed so that you can visit them. They can live on as virtual exhibitions themselves and I, that I, I think is really going to be a very valuable thing for the future. There we go. I think I've got through it in almost an hour. <laughs> and I think we, we now perhaps can um, see if we've got any questions, any people would like to discuss some of the ideas I've raised here. And uh, my thanks for your patience and my apologies for my slightly croaky voice. Uh, but as, as you can gather, I'm on, um, uh, on a, uh, I'm pleased to be giving you this speech. I hope it's been interesting. <clears throat> okay, so Paul, any, hello. Uh, hello. Oh, so many thanks for your great and very inspiring uh, lecture. Actually, an overview of comics, uh, yeah, comics in galleries and museums, and many many thanks of, for your great words about our show yeah. here. Actually, yeah. we did try also to include some contemporary artists who do not actually who are not comic artists at all who love comics or who loved comics, for example, mm. um, in the in a catalog we reproduced a part of a biography of Tomislav Gotovac. He is like a legendary performance artist. And in mm. his biography in 78, he writes that he actually uh, states the date when he first read Maurovich's comics and when he became addicted to comics. Uh, so uh, somehow it's uh, it was always somehow present in contemporary art, not only as a kind of um, consciousness regarding classes and of course yeah. approachability of art. Mm. Uh, but uh, I think it's also quite interesting to raise uh, the question on um, on uh, collecting action and also what does the original means in terms mm -hmm. of fetishism and also in terms of economical fetishism and how yeah. does it and also how does it relate both to the private property and also to the accessibility of the artworks and yeah. Yeah, yeah. who owns uh, uh, for example and also who owns the right to reproduce and to exhibit and to share art and i think comics with their really like uh, 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 multifaceted nature of both uh, extremely fragile in terms of original because as a paperwork there they're very uh, um, you cannot exhibit them for more than three mm -hmm. months they're cheap paper aren't they often very cheaply printed yes mm -hmm. yes uh, but at the uh, but at, uh, from the other point of view they, they were historically they were seen as a little bit more than a rubbish so mm -hmm. Somehow, how does uh, uh, do you think that this also uh, uh, how how does this attitude how does it work in contemporary comics? Maybe have you maybe uh, you met some or, or maybe saw some of the works that somehow deal with this materiality of the comics, both in economical and physical sense. I don't know if I was. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, okay, there are people that are, that are recycling, and um, we been, I mentioned the sampler man who is obviously working almost certainly digitally, but also there are artists, he does work physically with pieces of old comics and remakes them. Uh, I think the, the thing I would add here is that a lot of things that we assume, you and I know that, for example, a printed Sunday page, say, of Little Nemo in Slumberland or um, Crazy Cat, for example, they were printed obviously in well, thousands and thousands of copies. Um, but I remember when Spiegelman was first promote, um, presenting the project for the Masters of Comic, Comic Art Exhibition, the one I mentioned, the, the big one I didn't show anything from, but the one that was in LA um, some years ago. By the way, that was originally going to be a much deeper and more international exhibition. It got narrowed down to just being the, the core artists that they showed. He got together a whole bunch of museum curators who weren't knowledgeable about comics. And they couldn't, they didn't realize it until he explained to them that these, for example, these Sunday pages were as rare as say a Hogarth print or a Gilray or in other words there were very few of them that had survived um, and that they should be treated in many ways as an art object as, as, as much as the original artwork itself um, and as we know these are these are the fragile objects that are hard to display. I think the, the other real issue of course is that basically very I don't know very many museums that are very actively collecting I'm talking here about non-comics museums, obviously, but general art museums are collecting artwork from comics. They're certainly that they've missed the boat because, as we know, uh, I just got here, for example, this is the 
auction catalogue for the new heritage auction with a fantastic Charles Burns cover on the front of it, which is going to go for thousands of dollars over the weekend. I mean, possibly, and almost certainly. And the market has just mushroomed. And even that is interesting. Um, I'm not your top. I'm not asking your question directly, but it is the fact is that the artwork is no longer even it, it's not available for them to for them to acquire unless perhaps they find they make friends with the artists. I mean, presumably Marovich was uh, work was either came from his estate or from him personally. Unless you have those intimate one to one connections with an artist, now these artworks are going for a lot of money, and only the wealthy can can afford them. Um, and also, so if funds are as tight and purchasing funds are tight, no wonder many museums are going, well, we can't start opening the door to comics because you know, we can't afford them, for one thing. And if we do start to perhaps take on collections that are donated, which one could imagine might, might happen, then as you've done, you've got to decide, we've got to do something. We must catalog this. We need to treat it seriously. It cannot just be locked away in, in an archive and only accessed by special arrangement or something. You have to except it's going to be on your walls. It's going to have to be part of your mission to broaden the public's awareness of what art is. So it's a very, we're in a very fascinating time right now. Um, and I, I, I suppose one thing for me is, I'm so pleased that you're doing this. I wish we had more museums like yours in Zagreb to be quite this open. I mean, perhaps I could ask, was it, has it been, You've done exhibitions since at least the 70s. It's not been a topic that's off limits. And do you have ideas for doing more in the future? Is it something you see, well, we've done this one, we'd like to do um, other material. Is that something you're thinking of for MSU? Mm, definitely, definitely. Yeah. But, but actually, did um, um, have to say that our colleagues from uh, Klovice Gallery, another museum in yeah. Zagreb, they did yeah. fantastic retrospective shows of yeah. um, comic artists. So it's been kind of present, rather present in creation culture since uh, 1975. Uh, yeah, we've had a basically. lot going on, yeah, which are, which are tremendous, yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyhow, you still we don't have, um, there are very few. Uh, comics respect to the production in uh, public museums there are few yeah. there are mm. private collectors but still those work uh, those works are not in public museums and somehow i think comic artists would really love to have a comic and animation museum in croatia and also due to this yeah. long tradition of course if they have they should have their place in contemporary art museums uh, mm. and also museums of the city of zagreb but uh, since the uh, since the scene is quite uh, quite big, uh, maybe the prospect towards uh, an institution for animation, comics, or its own, it would be something that we spare, that really hope to see in the future. But, uh, that, 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 that's one reason why I, I, that's a whole other area, and I'm completely, obviously, I've, I've worked in a, in a cartoon museum here in London, and I've been to many of them, and they are marvelous institutions. Um, and I don't think we should say that, that, that um, uh, the only that we still have to struggle to get works into the, the fine art galleries. What some people would argue, why do you want to be in art galleries um, mm. uh, at all? Because there are some people, certainly some people, certainly within comics, who see it as a, uh, a lost cause or just they're rather a waste of time because the art world doesn't necessarily interest them. Um, and I think that there's so much potential, more potential for interaction and dialogue and conversation between so many different kinds of art. I mentioned photographic comics and photography. This is a whole field that you know, is just languishing. There have been some shows, um, Jan Weitens in Marseille did a wonderful one um, in, a, uh, in an art gallery. But th there's room that maybe, because sometimes the, a comics museum can actually be great, but also can be closed off because it actually says we don't do anything that isn't comics. And then that means that we're in this wonderful huge field of comics and, and maybe animation too or something, but then it means you're leaving out other things. And um, it's maybe a shame to have, uh, it may be, the best thing is to have both. The best thing is to have um, uh, the art world and the specialist comics world having venues of their own where comics can reach the public. I think that's, that's what we both would like to see. Um, yeah, and I think the, um, the deeper history is interesting because I didn't get a chance to mention that um, uh, I, I, I don't think your show, the To Be Continued show, that does, that doesn't include really anything pre-20th century, does it? It's all basically 
fairly modern. But you know, have you considered, or would there be any other museum perhaps in Zagreb that you could maybe partner with to do this deeper exploration, um, going back, Frank, perhaps to the cave paintings? Is that something that uh, would interest, would there be interest in something like that? It would be definitely a very interesting adventure, uh, a yeah. very interesting research. Actually, the first major museum show on comics, it was mm. done in uh, 19, um, 19, uh, 1986. It was uh, basically uh, comics in creation art from 1867. So it started like from it starts from 19th century. It comes from a 19th century print. Yes. Didn't it, starts, yeah. it didn't start from well, it didn't start from 15th century or like from different narrative mm. forms uh, of yeah. um, of sculpture or uh, painting, of course. But yeah. um, somehow in this uh, in this show we somehow we were focused on contemporary comics and also with some mm. references, with some, some historical references. But it was also because of an yeah, environment of art history museum but um, yes it would be it would be definitely be like a great big show and a oh, yeah, great yeah. adventure so we hope and colleagues uh, and uh, Darko Glau and did a fantastic, fantastic fantastic job they also did um, they repeat they did a similar show uh, uh, focused on Yugoslav comics in uh, Paris just a year after oh, or, nice. yes nice. Yeah. yes it was part of uh, program of Yugoslav uh, Cultural Center and uh, probably I think Zoran if he's now listening to us he will know a little bit more about it. Um, um, it it's just accompanying the show on Yugoslav cinema so it was ah, right, right. And the total crossover course between comics and cinema. Yeah. And uh, also the, the, the exhibition that I first mentioned it was part of the show that uh, actually it was focused on the written word in Croatia. So somehow, but I think it's maybe this exhibition could be just a start for a really a huge exhibition that would definitely involve more curators and also more. Yeah, interesting yeah. because there's, there's um, one of the, uh, one of the discussions that's been in, in, in the air is at the British Museum, I hosted a panel with several experts. One of them was an expert, for example, in Syrian art, another expert in in rock painting, in cave, mm. cave, so-called cave art, um, looking at all of the um, potentially connections or differences. Um, and it's, they are considering, the British Museum itself is considering um, how they can present this bigger tapestry, a bigger, longer story of how mankind has told stories and pictures, essentially, for, for so long. And the other thing I would like to mention also is, um, as well as, there's also folk art traditions, because one of the things I really loved were the Slovenian strip burger mm -hmm. um, crew who did an exhibition based around the tradition, uh, certainly in Slovenia anyway, of painting beehives. And they made a, they made, they invited con contemporary comic artists to make comics that were in the format of the beehive or related to the beehive, to this, to this tradition. So that's another thing, because, because I think one of the other um, things we mustn't forget is that a lot of folk art, traditional or even wrongly named, obviously primitive art, but mm -hmm. art forms, as I mentioned, the, the, the kavad, for example, in Rajasthan, they are clearly um, still around very often, still, still, still being made today, and are connected to, to, to comics traditions and could actually be informative and useful as part of how comics go forward. You know, by learning and applying some of their approaches to what we do next with the medium. Um, hasn't, I, I'm, that mm -hmm. is, is, is potential, I think, too. Yes, it might be, it maybe I've seen this beautiful example. You showed embroidered comics, and yeah. actually, it has also tradition. It was very popular here in this in the whole Yugoslav area in 30s, in 20s and 30s, and even later. Yes, you had like in rural houses, you had these uh, different images, uh, embroidered images with short messages. Mm -hmm. Usually, they were quite patriarchal, and they had like a, the, their aim was somehow to discipline women in a house and to tell them what to do and how to behave. Uh, how to behave made properly. by women, is that right? Sorry? They were made by women. Yes. We were yes. embroidering messages that they didn't necessarily... <laughs> but... <laughs> 
<laughs> but you have, um, uh, in, I think in the last 50, 15 years, you have this action, or even 20, of uh, Belgrade-based group Schart. Uh, so they have, uh, uh, they have a whole collective of uh, women uh, embroidery, em, em, embroidering. Uh, and they, what they do, they produce uh, feminist embroideries in that very, very traditional format. I think they, yeah. they, they publish images on Facebook, so they're very funny and very intelligent. Mm -hmm. And they are, of yeah. course, comment on difficult political issues. And of course, so it's, um, it's also like a beautiful example of this, this folk art. And of course, comics and folk art, I think it's been discuss a lot and also I want to just uh, mention like a beautiful maybe you've seen the works by Victor, Victoria Lomasco oh yes of course yes from Russia yes yes she had, a, she had a gallery show in London I went to where she was painting directly onto the walls and they mm. were like a cave painter I guess uh -huh. mm -hmm. they were tremendous yeah she's and she's very very outspoken isn't she very, mm. very yes yes and she's also very like active and very yeah engaged and so she presented her work in uh, in an exhibition created by uh, VHV, a curatorial collective from Zag from Zagreb who is now uh, working in Kunsthalle in Vienna so they're, they're like really contemporary uh, one of the best curatorial collectives in contemporary art in Europe right now so yeah so there's much to be hopeful for I think here and what we really want to see we want to see it's not, I don't think we are after cultural legitimacy. We, we don't care about that. They don't, <laughs> we do, I think, well, I certainly feel that we want to see this medium continue to astonish us, which it does mm -hmm. all the time anyway. But, but, but with these partnerships and these enrichments of exhibitions and connections with other institutions, it just makes more things possible, more things open out. Um, and more connections can be more, can be built with artists. You mentioned the um, performance artists, for example. You could mm. with people in other art forms who undoubtedly connect. I mean, there's a whole uh, history of theatrical versions of comics. Um, and and in fact, one friend of mine, um, Maggie Gray, here in the UK, is researching in Britain a lot of feminist and political and socialist theater that used elements of, uh, and characters of comics, the graphics mm -hmm. of comics, particularly in the 60s and 70s, um, for kind of agitprop theater. And this is, again, rather than having that sort of off out of our range, let's bring these things in and then also perhaps build on these things and, and develop new forms. We haven't always got to be um, just within the, the narrow confines of what ever is defined as a comic or our, our particular taste in comics and I suppose that's where I'm very I'm um, I think I'm very I'm probably too open-minded I'm just very very curious all the time about comics and I don't really live with a lot of nostalgia about them um, mm -hmm. I, I'm actually quite concerned about nostalgia and I, I because it affects everybody. we all get it but it but it can be something where you just pine for the past or um, and you never look at what's new and I'm wanting to try and see both. I want to see the past and see the future and see what we can, what can be stimulated. Um, and I, it's wonderful that there are many people, uh, artists and in a sense people like you and I, I think, who are in some kind of cultural spaces in positions to make change happen, to open doors and make opportunities um, arrive. That I think is, is, is hopeful. Good. Well, I think we've covered quite a lot. I've, I've done all the talking. Well, you've done some nice. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would just have check. Have we got any? Have we got anybody listening in, and anybody that wants to ask something? Otherwise, um, but uh, thank you. Yes, for here. just check I with. Uh, here. I can't see on my on my uh, screen. Yes, yeah. if I see anything on also on the SMSs. It's nice to have some in, some feedback, especially any any questions or I, uh, points of view. No, no, any questions. Okay. So, oh. but this is also oh. recorded, so isn't it? So it'll be available for for later viewing um, by people on on, on mm. Facebook or whatever. Yeah, it'll, it'll be available to other people. Yeah. Um, okay. Yes, it's my colleagues confirmed their questions. So. Okay. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>